Good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening for our friends on the European and African continents. Uh, thank you to, for joining us today for Fish and Richardson's Federal Circuit 2023 Year in Review webinar. I am John Dragseth. Today I'm here with my colleague Natika Fiorella and we will be your hosts talking about all things uh, 2023 at the Federal Circuit and beyond perhaps. Um, our biographies, the presentation, and the blank CLE form for New Jersey and New York should be available in your control panel for download. Note that you have to be logged into the webinar on your device if you want to get the CLE credit. You won't get the credit for just listening to the audio portion only. Uh, today's webinar will run for an hour, include at give or take, and include question and answer at the end or maybe in the middle. Uh, you can ask questions at any time using uh, the Q&A section of your control panel. We'll do our best to answer these at the end if uh, time permits, and I hope there will be time. We've tried to limit the, to limit the topics, but feel free to contact us personally after the webinar. We're easy to get a hold of and friendly folks. A um, little background, uh, why, why we're giving this. Uh, Natika and I together have done about 200 or more appeals to the Federal Circuit. We read the opinions regularly. We often give these year in review things. Um, both of us practice regularly. I clerked for Judge Clevenger long ago. Natika clerked for Chief Judge Prost at the time. She was Chief Judge before and isn't now. Um, so we have uh, a, a lot of experiences with experience with these sort of cases. And our goal here is to try to um, take all the cases. There's over 100 a year, pull out the most important ones, organize them, and then give you kind of practice pointers for each of the topics that we come up with. Um, and that's what, what we hope to do today. But I do have to give you a preview of our next upcoming program so that you can sign up for it if you're interested. That's going to happen Tuesday, February 22nd. My colleagues Christina Brown Marshall and Dexter Whitley are going to host Hatch Waxman 101. It'll serve as an accessible introduction to those of you who have limited experience with the Hatch Waxman Act. And it'll provide a foundation for more advanced discussions that uh, we should be having in upcoming webinars. Um, but that stuff is so important, Natika is actually uh, going to start with a lot of life sciences uh, uh, issues that, that uh, are the focus of, of Hatch Waxman. So you're going to get plenty of Hatch Waxman fun out of Fish and Riches in, uh, during February. Finally, before we get started, I have to remind you the content of this presentation is for educational purposes only, does not necessarily reflect the opinions of Fish and Richardson or of cl our clients. It's not intended to address every court or case situation if this was legal advice, we would be billing you. And I should also say, sometimes I even say things in CLEs that even I don't agree with, let alone the firm or our clients. Um, just to have fun. Uh, with that, I will begin uh, by throwing it over to Natika, who will cover our first topic. Hi, all. Happy to be here. And thank you guys for spending some of your Valentine's Day with us. Uh, next slide, please. You can go right to the next slide. Thanks. So as John mentioned, we're going to start off with a few cases in the life sciences space and particularly ones that deal with 112 issues. Issues like written description and enablement uh, have been getting a lot of attention from the federal circuit in the recent years, and that trend continued through 2023 as well. And as I'm sure many of you know, it's not just the federal circuit. In fact, we had the Supreme Court take up a patent case and specifically an enablement case in 2023. So we're gonna start there with the recap, a short recap of the Supreme Court's Amgen decision. Um, our main focus will be on what the federal circuit has done since that decision. Uh, but if you are interested in getting a deeper dive into Amgen itself, our FISH colleagues presented a webinar on this shortly after the opinion came out, which is available on our website. So please feel free to check that out. Before the recap, so setting the stage, this case addressed enablement of genus claims. The claims at issue covered antibodies that target a particular protein called PCSK9, which also, which causes a reduction of bad cholesterol, the LDL levels. Now, the specification disclosed amino acid sequences for 26 of the claimed antibodies. And so Sanofi argued, well, hold on, there's millions of antibody candidates that fall within the scope of the claims because they're written in functional terms. 
essentially they covered any antibody that binds to the protein and some additional residues. Sanofi also said that antibody generation is unpredictable. So practicing the full scope of the claims requires a lot of trial and error. And so they said the claims were not enabled. Amgen, on the other hand, said there's no enablement issue because the patent did provide a well understood roadmap of how to get to a subset of 384 antibodies that do meet the claimed requirements. So what happened? The district court agreed with Sanofi and so did this federal circuit. Federal Circuit said the claims were broad, both in number and in functional diversity, and there just wasn't enough in the specification to tell a skilled artisan what falls within and what does not. So the court said claims were not enabled because a skilled artisan could not make and use the full scope of the invention without undue experimentation. And then the case went to the Supreme Court. And here the focus was really on that full scope aspect does enablement require that a skilled artisan be able to make and use the full scope of the invention? And the Supreme Court said, in a nutshell, yes. If you claim an entire class, then the specification has to enable a skilled artisan to make that entire class. The patent in Amgen didn't do so, so the Supreme Court affirmed the finding of lack of enablement. Next slide, please. So this is just kind of a representation to give you a little bit of a feel um, for what we're seeing in the 112 space, specifically with enablement. Um, so on the left, you have, for example, a patent that's probably not gonna pass muster under 112. What we tried to show here is a situation where you claim a broad genus, but your specification only discloses a very small number of species that are all kind of grouped together, very similar, not representative across your you know, big green circle here of the claim to genus. Now contrast that with the middle picture where now you have some description of specific species, maybe a few more than the first example. And importantly, they're, they're kind of spread out across that claimed genus. So you have more of that representative aspect to give guidance to the skilled artisan. That's gonna be a, a better situation for you under the current 112 law. But the best is, is what we have on the right. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the right is basically trying to get at hitting both prongs. You want representative amount of species. So we see a bunch of dots and they're kind of spread across the, the green background. But then there's almost like sub genuses here because you've done enough description in the spec for some of these disclosed species that a skilled artisan can say, okay, this one is disclosed. You've told me enough about it. So I can tell that XYZ other species would also fall within the claims. Basically giving not only number of species, but more qualitative description of the types of species that fall within the claimed genus. Next slide, please. Okay, so what has happened since Amgen? Well, the Federal Circuit recently decided another case also involving antibody claims also involving functional claiming, and also involving a claim that there was a roadmap in the specification. <clears throat> and unsurprisingly, perhaps, the Federal Circuit said this Baxalta case is materially indistinguishable from Amgen. Um, so in that case, the Federal Circuit affirmed summary judgment of no enablement. Similar to Amgen, the claims in Baxalta covered all antibodies that bind to a specific blood coagulating factor, of which there were millions of candidates. Again, the specification only disclosed amino acids for a small number of those, here just 11 of the claimed antibodies. And in fact, the inventors found that using a routine screening process described in the specification, only about 1.6% of the antibodies they screened actually had the claimed or desired result. It was also undisputed that the only way to figure out which antibodies fall within the claims versus not is to actually make them and screen them. So the Federal Circuit said this is Amgen all over again. Claim is too broad, spec is too limited, and the need to make and screen all the antibodies is basically the definition of trial and error. So it held that the claims were invalid 
for lack of enablement. Next slide, please. So now we're going to switch from enablement to another prong of the 112 statute, which is written description. And here we have the Regents of University of Minnesota case. Um, this case involves Gilead's IPR of the university's patent, which was directed to prodrugs pro of nucleoside derivatives that prevented viruses from reproducing or cancerous tumors from growing. So in the IPR, Gilead challenged Minnesota's right to priority to applications filed earlier than Gilead's patent on its commercial product. Specifically, Gilead said Minnesota's earlier applications didn't have written description support for the claims that recited a specific subgenus of compounds. Well, the board agreed, and so too did the federal circuit. The court noted that Minnesota didn't actually argue that its earlier applications provided a representative number of species to provide written description support for the claimed genus. Instead, Minnesota argued that the earlier applications literally describe or provided blaze marks to select the species needed to arrive at the claim. It did so through kind of a convoluted combination of several different claims from the various earlier applications that all recited different substituents. And, and basically the federal circuit said, that's not written description support. It's just too complicated. It's just too convoluted to try to say that a skilled artisan would truly understand that the inventors possessed the claimed invention. And in making that finding, they reiterated that simply disclosing one possible compound choice for one position of a molecule doesn't mean there is the required support for every species or subgenus that uses that compound choice. All right, next slide. <clears throat> so these are not 112 cases, but just to kind of round out our life sciences aspect here. We have a few updates on what are called the skinny label cases. Um, main news on this front from the last year is that the Teva versus GSK case, and in that case, Teva petitioned for Supreme Court review of the Federal Circuit's decision reinstating a jury verdict of infringement in favor of GSK under a partial label theory. Uh, the Supreme Court asked for views from the solicitor who recommended in favor of taking the case up, but the Supreme Court ultimately denied cert. So that appeal is officially done. Now, later in the year, the Federal Circuit had the opportunity to decide another skinny label case, um, and that's this H. Lundbeck versus Lupin case. And uh, that case was a Hatch-Waxman case in which the claims were directed to the specific use of an antidepressant and there was no dispute there that the label at issue had carved out the claimed indication. So what happened there? Well, the plaintiff tried to argue that it doesn't matter that the drug that Lupin proposed to sell would not be used by a use covered by the patents because it could still be prescribed for those patented uses even if the label doesn't have them specifically listed. And here the court said, no, no, we already have cases on this. We're going to, you know, agree with all the previous precedent we've already explained that says the use claimed in the patent has to be the same use for which the applicant is seeking market approval. And it also found that plaintiff's evidence for inducing infringement was insufficient because it was a Hatch-Waxman case, so all plaintiff could really point to was the label itself, which had carved out that claimed indication. Now, in doing so, in making that second determination, the court distinguished this Lundbeck case from GSK, saying that while well, in GSK, the jury had evidence of, for example, advertising activities and promotional materials that encourage infringement. Um, so that made that case different, uh, situated differently situated than the Lundbeck case. All right, next slide, please. So what are some takeaways or practice pointers from these life sciences cases. Um, well, first and foremost is think carefully about your 112 issues. Uh, we're gonna get into some specifics related to those, but as I mentioned in the very beginning, they have been and continue to be a hot topic at court, at the court level, and um, really have 
taken down some some big jury verdicts in the past. Uh, so it's uh, something to definitely keep your eye on, regardless of what side you're on. Um, so let's talk about prosecuting first. In in the 112 space, what do you want to do? You want to get as many and as varied examples as possible and identify common connections <coughs> to let those examples cover more ground. So this is what we were kind of trying to show with the, with the pictures after the Imgen case. Um, similarly, try to get claims of varying breadth. That way you have some claims that are a little broader, some claims that are a little narrower, better chance of succeeding down the road if your patent ever gets to litigation. Um, consider the quantity and quality of your disclosure. So again, this is the idea of have enough representative species, but also describe them well enough so you're not just limiting yourself to the exact words in the specification. A skilled artisan can bring their knowledge and experience from the field and understand based on your description what else would fit within the claims and what would not. Um, when litigating, you know, make sure you're talking to your experts about how to frame the scope of the claims and the disclosed embodiments. Keep 112 in the background from the very, very beginning, even if it's not already in the case. Um, similar to when you're prosecuting, think about both qualitative and quantitative issues in terms of the species. You know, trying to identify potential issues or potential strengths early on when litigating will give you a leg up later should the issue ever come to the forefront. And then not in the 112 space, if you're in a skinny label situation, you want to look closely at whether the label fully and completely carves out the claimed indication and what evidence there is to show encouragement to infringe, not just describing a potential infringement, you need that encouragement aspect for inducement. So that's what I have on the life sciences space. So I will turn it back over to John to, I think, talk about obviousness next. All right, next slide, please. Let's power through 103. Next slide, please. Um, you know, just as an intro, I would say if there's one thing you should learn up on, is that English, um, is 103. It's every case has 103 now because pretty much every case ends up at the PTAB. Um, you, you know, the 102 comes up, but 103 is always there because at least for the dependent claims, you're gonna have 103. And I think there's a long distance between how people approach 103 and uh, how they ought to approach it. I think uh, we're a little bit too mechanic, mechanistic, mechanical in our application of 103. Oh, reference A, reference B, motivation to combine, boom, 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 bolt them together and out we go. And I think a lot of that comes from reading office actions where uh, uh, examiners are mechanistic in their application of 103. Um, and we need to, to fight away from, um, well, we should have more imagination in the way we treat 103, I think. And so um, if I were to invest in my future, whether I was a 20, 30, 40, 50 year old patent lawyer, I would spend a lot of time trying to figure out what are the edges of 103 and then thinking about where they should go. And so we'll talk a little bit about that with these cases. The first two cases are a couple of Medtronic Teleflex cases that came out this summer, early summer, uh, that Judge Moore wrote. And, uh, and I have a little bit of a Moore theme going through here and we'll talk about that at the end. Um, these are long cases, but they have a lot of rules in them. So I think they're very important cases to know about. Next slide, please. And I don't know if they got that much press when they came out, right? So here's one rule in the first case. And I, in the last slide there, I had the two cases uh, listed. So the first one is case one in this example. And, and, and you see the front page of it also to, to anchor you to which case to look at, because there's, there's a lot of text in these case, in these two cases. So this is just, this, this first rule is, is nothing crazy. It just says, if you want to prove copying in the 103 context, we're going to steal from copyright law and say, well, if you have access and substantial similarity, uh, those sorts of uh, rules that can can establish copying circumstantially. Um, I'm just amazed that this had never been said before. It's it's not doesn't seem controversial to me. It's it's interesting. Um, I just don't think copying comes up that much. Right. So it's not a huge issue. Um, but I do put in here, you know, distinguish between copying a product and copying an invention. Sometimes 
the the invention just comes along for the ride if somebody's copying um and and you might be able to have counter evidence to say listen we didn't copy your invention we didn't care about your invention it just conveniently came along i mean there's copying in in the hatch waxman context where you have to copy someone's label and therefore you have to copy their invention and the courts have said well we're going to kind of discount that sort of copying because it's not you know it's not showing praise for the invention it's just showing uh, the practicalities of the hatch waxman world where you have to you have to copy um, because otherwise the FDA won't give you quick approval. Um, but, you know, pay attention to this rule. It, it probably won't come up in a lot of your cases, but it is new to my knowledge and, it, and it's important if it, if it is present in the facts of your case. Next slide, please. Rule number two, this one's more important and more general. And there's this idea that, you know, I, I'd always envision prior art as being binary, right? It's either prior art and in, in for a dime, in for a dollar, or it's not prior art and it's out. This rule tends to suggest that lesser known features, lesser known rare prior art, isn't gonna be quite as strong as the stuff everybody knows about, okay? And I think there's some tension here with the Winslow tableau, which we all learn about in law school, where the, the hypothetical artisan is sitting in their garage and, and taped to the wall is every piece of prior art in the world around them, right? And this is now saying, well, some of those pieces of prior art, you know, extraneous to the garage are stronger or less strong. So we're kind of putting the person out in the world, this hypothetical artisan, and saying, well, they're gonna give more weight to certain art than other art. Um, this is a more interesting rule. I'm not sure if I like it or, or don't like it, but it's here. I'm not sure if other judges will pick up on it or not, but, uh, but it is interesting and, and it uh, jumped out at me. Uh, next slide, please. What do we got? Rule three. Yeah, there's like three actual kind of unique uh, uh, things in here. I don't, but you know, rule three might be more of a restatement of something that's been said before. So this is the idea of okay, you got secondary indicia, um, and you're saying, well, my invention has commercial success, and therefore you should find it non-obvious, right? Because um, uh, uh, people, you know, would have come up with it if there was money to be made. And my, I made money off of it. The fact that nobody else came up with this uh, commercially successful invention shows that there was a hurdle to clear, a non-obvious hurdle to clear, and I cleared it and I got the money. Um, and what the court says, well, you got to show to get that, to connect you know, your invention to the success, you have to show uh, that a single reference in the prior art disclosed the full combination of features they're alleged to create the success, not that the features were each individually known, or I guess to show the counter of that, right? So it's not enough to say, well, you know, I can piece together the stuff that provided the success. It's like, no, you have to say that something else out there, uh, a single thing had all those features and therefore the success couldn't have been because of those features in your claim, because the prior art had those features and wasn't successful or, or was just as successful as yours, whatever. The success cannot be tied to your features, all right? Um, this has been said, I think, probably by the Federal Circuit too, so I don't know if it's a new rule, but I think there's a lot of good language in this opinion. So, you, you know, if, if you have a little notepad where you keep track of all these sub-issues, um, this might be your case, your kind of go-to case if this when this issue comes up. Next slide, please. All right, case two, rule number one. If the entire purpose of the prior art was to do something, then the pro proposed combination wipes out that purpose. This strongly points to non-obviousness. Um, again, a rule that's out there, Natika had a case a, couple, a few years ago now, maybe two to three years ago now, um, called Kimurs that I always cite for this proposition of, uh, you know, in her case, it was um, uh, putting plastic around wires that you would pull out of an extrusion machine. And the idea of the one prior art reference, I think, was that you either had a narrow distribution of, of, of weight in your chemistry um, and to, to to do the combination, you had to have a broad distribution or maybe it was the opposite. But anyway, the, the thing that the primary reference thought it had, which was let's say narrow, 
would be destroyed if it was combined because it went to broad, right? And so those, this and Comores are a couple good cases for that sort of thing. This is not saying, you know, physical combination would, would ruin some physical feature because that's an illegitimate argument. It's more the idea, the concept that was central to the primary reference is being wiped out. And so it's a good case uh, for, you know, destroying the entire purpose. And it's not just one purpose, right? It's gotta be the central or the entire purpose of, of the prior art. Uh, next slide, please. Um, what do we got? Oh, this is not case two rule one. I have the wrong heading on this one. But anyway, there's other cases that um, that these follow from that Judge Moore has, has come up with. Uh, and I list them here from prior years. So we're supposed to be talking about 2023. Philip Morris is, is, is uh, 2023, but the other two are from earlier. And it's kind of a, um, you know, I think Judge Moore knows what she's doing. She's pushing this. Normally, I, I'd be up in arms about that, a, a judge with a, an agenda, so to speak. But I think this is smart what she's doing. I think other judges are going to pick up on it. I've heard Judge Dyke even, who was not happy with Apple versus Samsung, I've heard him in oral arguments say things that were positive about this. And what this is, is to look at motivations in the prior art in a more flexible manner, okay? It's not just teaching toward or teaching away, but it's something I call more dissuasion and persuasion. Those are my words, not hers. Um, so you can have a reference that doesn't fully teach away, okay? But it might dissuade, like in Arctic Cat, which is a case I did, um, the, the prior art basically said, hey, take this thing, that, this safety feature on boats, and we might want to put it on jet skis, on, on um, what you see in the picture there. It's not a jet ski. I know it's a personal watercraft, PWC. Um, you know, so there was like almost an anticipation in the prior art. But at the same time, there were things that there were references that said, eh, you know, the boats don't always translate into jet skis. They're different sizes. They're different dynamics and that sort of thing. People die you know, if we'd get this wrong, right? So there were dissuasions, not teaching away, no no reference said don't try this in personal watercraft, but there were plenty of safety concerns and other things that would dissuade. And so in Articat, they affirmed a jury verdict that the patents were valid, even though there was some really good prior art to make them invalid, but there was other art that, you know, at least pushed for caution and that was enough to support a jury verdict. That's another thing. Judge Moore is very good about, you know, she's a post, uh, post, uh, what, uh, I guess it would be cell attacks and those types of cases judge who says, listen, if there are fact disputes, we have to affirm the jury. And that's really what both Apple and Articat were about was there were fact disputes, a jury made the decision. And, you know, whether we think it would have been obvious or not, we're not gonna step on the jury. Um, so keep that in mind, that more flexibility. I would say that even pushes toward perhaps a patent owner bringing in more prior art. This is, nobody does this, right? I never see patent owners bring in prior art to muddy up the Winslow tableau, right? So instead of Winslow having two references in front of him and he can just bolt them together and it's easy peasy, right? The primary reference, the secondary reference and away we go. Too many patent owners, in my view, allow that to happen and don't come in and say, wait a minute, wait, here's six other references that, you know, push for caution or maybe they don't point away, but they point in other directions. And you need to understand that whole story that was facing the uh, hypothetical artisan of ordinary skill. Um, next slide, please. All right, now uh, this year, a couple of extra cases. These aren't that important. It, you know, Schwendemann, this is a, I'm in Minneapolis. Schwendemann is, is a, a local who um, came up with an invention for kind of um, iron-on graphics for T-shirts. They figured out that the graphics don't look very good when the T-shirt is black. And so they said, well, let's start by having a little white layer on the piece of paper, and then you can inkjet print your design onto the white layer. And then when you, um, when you uh, lay this onto the, the t-shirt, the white layer goes underneath and the graphic goes on top. And so the graphic sticks out more because there's a white backing. 
and uh, and she had lots of reasons why you wouldn't make that that uh, combination. But at the end of the day, the court looked and said, you know, it's almost an anticipation. You could use common sense. And she had an extra argument that said, well, you have to show a reason for picking the primary reference. And the federal circuit rejected that and said, no, you don't need some extra reason why the skilled artisan would pick up a primary reference. You don't need a reason why they'd make it primary versus secondary. If you have two references and you can show a reason to combine them, and usually, you know, facing a similar problem is a reason for that too, um, that's enough. And then Kuvaris. Um, this was a um, case where, let me see here, it was a method to increase prostacyclin release to increase vasodilation, I, you know, big words in the life sciences realm, right? But the idea here is that it, you took two drugs, you gave them together, and they reached a result. And that both of the drugs had been given for uh, cardiac reasons before, there was plenty of evidence of why you would give both of them and, and, and so on. And the court said, well, the inherent result of that, um, even if it was unexpected, doesn't buy you anything because it was inherent. It flowed naturally from administering those two things. Um, and so just because that was expected, as long as there was a motivation to combine the two, right? So that's the thing you have to be careful. If there was no other motivation to combine the two or some reason to not combine the two, then maybe Kuvaris would have won. But there was evidence to combine them, and therefore the inherent thing that came from combining them, even if it was unexpected, didn't get the patent owner any, uh, any mileage. Next slide, please. All right, practice pointers. I think we've basically covered these. You know, be flexible in your analysis of obviousness. Um, one one extra thing I don't like when people refer to you know taking the widget of Smith and combining it with the widget of Jones. I, I prefer some, something like the widget like that of Smith because if you say the widget of Smith, that opens it, and you're a petitioner, that opens you to the patent owner saying, oh wow, you couldn't combine the widget of Smith. You know, because it's square and Jones's is round and, and you would destroy uh, what they are, right? You walk right into kind of a physical combinability counter argument when you use that sort of language. But if you, if you say a widget like that of Smith, you're more at the higher level of combining ideas from the prior art, not combining structures uh, from the prior art. And then the final point, develop a simple logical story you know, try to back up from this, take A, take B, bolt them together, and here's your motivation to combine. Try to say, try to think, you know, the real hypothetical artisan, why would they make this combination and, and put that forward? And you can do the technical stuff with it, make sure that your uh, expert crosses T's and dots I's, but have some sort of logical story that goes with your combination. And then I'm going to pause for a second. I was asked if I have anything crazy for today. I don't, but I have my uh, Valentine's Day song recommendation, which is I Used to Love Him by uh, uh, Lauren Hill on her album, The Miseducation of Lauren Hill. It's a breakup song, kind of, um, but I highly recommend it for fo folks. And Mary J. Blige is on that song with her. So with non-obviousness out of the way, and hip hop recommendations out of the way, I'll throw it back to you, Natika. Thanks, John. I have no recommendations for you guys, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, I do have plenty of very interesting cases to talk about with respect to PTAP procedure. So why don't we get into that next? Uh, next slide, please. All right, so what we're gonna talk about here is really what does the board need to do in terms of explaining its decisions, in terms of giving opportunities to the parties, um, you know, really on the process side as opposed to more of the substance side that you just heard John talk about. Um, of course, the Federal Circuit is still hearing many, many cases from the PTAB. So these issues are coming up in lots of the mostly non-PREC, but some PREC cases that we see coming out of the court. Um, so why don't we start the slide 20. We have some of the cases where the court said the board did everything right in terms of procedure. They explained their decisions just fine and uh, really rejected all of the arguments 
from the losing party as to, you know, the board maybe just not doing enough or spending enough time. So we've already kind of talked about the first two cases that are on the slide today on the substance. Um, so now we're going to focus on the procedure part of the cases. In the uh, the first one, we we see that the the court found that the board doesn't have to make explicit findings on every single assertion that a party's expert makes. Um, you know, there there was some dispute over. Okay, well. The board didn't really say anything about this particular thing that our expert talked about, and that's really problematic. And you court can't fully understand the decision from the board because they didn't provide you that guidance. And the court said, no, no, not necessary. Board doesn't need to make explicit findings as long as their reasoning generally is understandable and there is a discernible path. And that's pretty much exactly what they said again in the Medtronic case. Um, board doesn't have to address every argument from the petitioner. You can't just say if they didn't address it, that means they ignored it. It could also mean the board just didn't find those arguments sufficient to meet the petitioner's burden. And that's how the court read the board's decision on Medtronic and found no APA violation, because again, the board's path was discernible. In the Electa case, again, court found no problem with the board's analysis even though it didn't make any express finding on reasonable expectation of success. But that's because it found a lack of expectation of success finding to be implicit in the board's analysis on motivation to combine. Um, so there, the board specifically said, no, no motivation here to combine because doing so would result in a inoperable device, one with inferior quality. So again, while not expressly styled as reasonable expectation of success, certainly there was a flavor of that in the board's decision when it found that there would be no motivation to combine the references in the first place. And the court said, that's plenty. Um, the INCEPT case, more of the same. The court blessed the board's decision, including the way in which it handled the commercial success evidence that was presented in the case, the other side said they didn't, the board didn't give it enough analysis and the court said, no, it did just fine in terms of acknowledging what the party said and coming to a decision um, on obviousness. All right, next slide, please. <coughs> okay, so then on this slide, we have a few cases where the board didn't quite get it right. Um, and so in all of these, the court vacated the board's decisions uh, for further proceedings with a little bit of guidance on, on what the board needs to do a better job on. So first we have this Corphotonics case. Um, the court vacated the board's decision here because it just couldn't tell whether substantial evidence supported the board's conclusion that one of the prior art references was actually analogous art. Uh, the court said that the board's analysis rested on an undisputedly incorrect fact about what the prior art taught. Now, Apple tried to say, oh, well, the board just made a typographical er error here. Um, the board said that the prior art describes different fields of view, but the prior art only described cameras with different points of view, and that fields versus points, that's just a typo. Nothing to see here, the board was fine. The court said, not so fast. We can't tell if that really was a typo or not between fields and points. And if it was not a typo, then that's a, a pretty big deal because that is not what the prior art taught. Um, and so we just don't know. So the court vacated the decision and asked for more explanation from the board on that point. Um, similarly in Volvo, court said the board's analysis was overly vague and ambiguous when it came to evaluating the objective evidence of non-obviousness and really explaining like what weight it believed the different evidence carried. So, you know, as an example, the court noted there was definite clear evidence of copying, um, some evidence of commercial success and industry praise, but the board just said each of those is entitled to some weight. Didn't really explain why, why was some weight not a lot of weight, especially in the context of the copying, 
or why they each get the same amount of weight, just not enough there um, for the court to really understand the board's reasoning. And then in the final conclusion, that problem persisted. The board just didn't explain its ultimate conclusion that the petitioner's obviousness evidence outweighed the subjective evidence beyond just saying that it did. Um, so the court vacated and remanded for the board to make additional findings on objective indicia. And then finally, we have the exonics case here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there, the court vacated the board's decision because the board refused to consider the petitioner's evidence and argument under a new claim construction, um, a claim construction that the patent owner proposed after institution. Um, and so the court said, you know, that's, that's not right. Um, we need to be able to address things that change during the course of the IPR. And here, there was no concern that what the petitioner was trying to bring in was a new reference, for example, or you know, relying on completely new embodiments, something very different and apart from what they relied on the on in the petition. In fact, the petitioner was relying on the same embodiments, embodiments from the same references that it did in the petition and simply making different arguments based on those embodiments under a new construction. Um, and the court said, the board should have allowed them to do that. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a related issue. Um, sometimes people are not really sure how to frame these disputes. Are they, you know, discretion-based disputes from the board, or is this really a question of whether there was an APA violation? They're very closely intertwined. Um, so these two cases are a little bit more focused on the APA aspect. But like I said, there was flavors of this in the previous cases that we just talked about as well. Um, so first here we have the Netflix case. <coughs> here the court found that the board didn't ignore any of petitioner's arguments. Instead, it found them unclear. It just said the petitioner's arguments were sufficiently unclear. So it couldn't really understand what arguments they were making and what they were not in the petition. And the court said the board did not abuse its discretion in thus reading the petition as failing to include those arguments that the petitioner wanted to then make on appeal. Uh, the court came out the other way though, in the Apple case. There the board found the claims patentable largely based on a typo by Apple's expert, um, which the board said rendered the expert's analysis unreliable. Now, the patent owner only mentioned this typo once in passing in the background section of a response. You know, parties did not brief, argue, or even suggest that this typo was going to be dispositive of anything. But the board basically found it dispositive, and uh, it didn't really provide a reasoned explanation for why it found this typo so meaningful. Um, so the board, so the court said that the board violated the IPA's notice requirements um, and vacated his decision because the parties really just didn't have a chance to fully argue over whether this typo was as big of a deal as the board found or not. Next slide. All right, so here we just, to round out this section, we have a few cases on what, what happens after IPRs or PGRs. Um, so in the Ironburg case, the question revolved around estoppel in district court after an IPR. And the court simply found that the litigating patentee bears the burden to establish that the alleged infringer could have raised a particular ground in the IPR in order for estoppel to apply. And the test for whether a reference reasonably could have been raised is whether a skilled searcher would have found the relevant reference. Um, so that's the that's the test. I'm sure it's the one that we're going to be see applied quite a bit because estoppel comes up um, fairly often in these contexts where you have parallel IPRs or post grant reviews and district court litigation. So now we have a case we can cite to with with a specific test for that purpose. Uh, the next case is the Purdue Pharma case. Here, so it's a slightly different issue. Um, not really the end or after a PGR, but it was a, it was a timing issue. 
Um, so here the patent owner really wanted to just terminate completely a PGR proceeding because the board didn't issue its final written decision within a year, which the statute requires. Um, the court said, no, we're not going to just terminate the, the whole proceeding because of that. Um, it, it did a kind of statutory interpretation analysis, looked at some Supreme Court case law, which says that when the statute itself doesn't say what consequences there will exist for missing a deadline, then the federal court here, the federal circuit, shouldn't be the one to impose their own sanction in the first place. Um, so the court basically said, yes, the board has to get this done within a year, but it doesn't say what happens if the board doesn't. So we're not gonna take the step forward of saying the entire proceeding has to be terminated. And then finally, we have the Algenesis case. Um, this case, the IPR finished uh, and Algenesis tried to appeal the board's finding um, that upheld certain challenge claims as patentable, but the court dismissed the appeal for lack of standing. Um, so we've, I know in previous presentations, talked about standing quite a bit. It is still a very important part of this interplay between the board decisions and the court. Um, people sometimes don't remember or forget that just because you have standing to file an IPR does not mean you automatically have standing to file an appeal from that IPR. And so in this case, um, Algenesis tried to establish that it had standing. It did submit a declaration, uh, but the court said that declaration was just too conclusory. It really didn't establish the facts necessary to show that there were concrete plans um, that Algenesis planned to take uh, that would result in a sufficient risk of future infringement. So the court said no standing and dismissed the appeal without getting to the merits. All right, next slide, please. Um, so here are just some practice pointers. Uh, I think we, again, kind of touched on a lot of them and some are just good practice tips no matter what, whether you're reading these cases or not. Um, but you know, a few that I'll highlight. As the petitioner, you really want to take a very, very close look at your petition. Um, although we certainly have seen some cases where the court is and the board is likely or able to let you give more information in your reply or you know, expand on arguments and so forth. It is a very easy response by a patent owner to come back and say, wait, wait, that wasn't in your petition. Um, and so make sure you're spending the time that you need to have your petition cover everything you can possibly think of. Um, and that kind of ties into the second one. Consider those wild claim constructions. You know, like you might think you're going to win on something because of the way that you are reading the claim, but, you know, think about whether it could be read in a different way if you were trying to avoid um, in unpatentability finding and make sure you're doing your best to address those additional arguments. You may, like in the cases we see, get the opportunity to prevent, pre present new positions if a claim construction changes, but why bank on that when, if you can, um, you can preempt it from the get-go. Um, as a patent owner, uh, you know, we've seen actually a lot on secondary considerations, objective indicia, um, that used to not be as big of a thing in, in PTAB cases, and it seems like it's coming up more and more. So make sure that you are on top of them. You know, Don't wait until the last minute. Don't use them as an oversight. The court does seem to be looking into how the board treats objective indicia. So you know, load up your evidence as much as possible um, and make sure that the board does what it needs to do. <coughs> and then you know, for either a petitioner or patent owner, as we've seen through these cases, there's there's a lot of kind of ticky tacky appellate issues that pop up, um, and a lot of them have to do with preservation. So it might be helpful to get some you know appellate counsel or at least some guidance uh, so that you are making sure that you're covering all the bases and setting yourself up for the best possible outcome, not just at the end of the board's proceedings, but after appeal as well. All right, uh, next slide. I think I'm turning it back to John for the last section of the day.
Excellent. Time to bring the cattle back into the barn and we're going to do it using claim construction as you do. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you know, I don't like necessarily having claim construction as a topic on these year in review things because, you know, ever since Phillips, there hasn't been like a big case that applies broadly across claim construction. They're all uh, a, a little bit sui generis, uh, you know, but I've tried to find a handful of cases here that can have some applicability outside their own facts, right? So many claim construction cases are so dependent on what the specification says and so on. So I've tried to identify cases that maybe can apply elsewhere for you. So the first one is Pacific Biosciences. And I just took the, the two, two life science cases here that I cared about. And then the next slide will be uh, software related or non-life science. Um, that's a fairly arbitration law, arbitrary line because uh, the rules here could apply in other areas. So this is one that, that talked about a, identifying a single biomolecule. And the claim construction question was, well, do you have to like really identify a single biomolecule? What if, what if you started with a single one and then you copied it a bunch of times and then you found the cluster and then you inferred from the cluster that the single one exists. Wouldn't that be identifying a single bio molecule? Uh, you know, a little circuitous, but you get there eventually. And the Federal Circuit said no and affirmed and said, listen, the, the word single is, I think they said striking here, right? Ordinary, this is pretty much an ordinary meaning type of case, right? Why do you put single if, in your claim if you want the circuitous route, really? Um, and and you know, I think the, the lesson of this case for folks is be really careful with your modifiers, your adjectives, your adverbs. Um, take a look at them if you're a patent drafter. Take a look at them if you're doing a pre-suit and say, you know, what what is this modifier doing here? Um, can it be misconstrued? Um, I don't know if the, you know, if the person who drafted this patent, they very well may have intended to have it be this narrower meaning, maybe after the fact, um, the patent he wanted it to be broader than the prosecutor had wanted, but the prosecutor may have faced some prior art and wanted it to be narrow. We always assume that the uh, narrow meaning go runs contrary to what the prosecutor was trying to do, but that, that may not be the case. So I'm not criticizing the prosecutor here, but I am saying be purposeful when adding uh, uh, modifiers, whether adjectives, adverbs, anything else. Um, then Actelion, I love this issue because for years I've, I've said, what about significant digits, people? Get a claim construction based on, you know, didn't we all have ninth grade physics and they taught us about significant digits and we didn't really know what they were talking about. Um, but uh, this is one, if, you, if the claim says 12, well, does 11.6, or if it says a pH of uh, uh, eight or above, does 7.7 .7 qualify as a pH of eight or above? And uh, you know, the average man or woman on the street would say, no, 7.7 .7 is not eight or above. But the, the nerd from physics class says, well, the claim said eight or above. It didn't say 8.0 or above. So there you go. Um, and what the Federal Circuit basically held in this case is, it could be one, it could be the other. You need to go look at some of these textbooks and other extrinsic evidence to help us figure out which one it is. You know, kind of raises the question, do you always have to go to extrinsic evidence? I don't think so, right? What if the specification had, uh, you know, like parts per billion, and they said, you know, 1200.0 parts per billion, and then they had pH, and they said more than eight, okay? Not 8.0. You, you could probably look at that and say, listen, the drafter knew how to put 1200.0 in when they wanted to indicate precision, and they didn't put it in when they said more than eight. Um, and therefore, we should assume that, you know, 7.5 can be construed to be eight and therefore meet a, a claim limitation of eight or more, right? So, you know, it's interesting. What if it said more than eight? So then you construed, uh, you know, 7.6. To, to be eight and then not meet the limitation of more than eight. But, um, but the bottom line here is there is more space sometimes in these claims by using significant digits and rounding than you might otherwise think. Next slide. Okay, software cases. Um, storage element, I think the, the 
takeaway from this case is, well, first of all, I don't know why somebody didn't argue that this was subject to 112.6, but uh, that was not discussed in the case. But they had a paragraph in the spec that said, you know, something along the lines of as used herein, and the Federal Circuit had a long discussion about that and other passages in the specification indicating lexicography, okay? So the reason I flag this is it's a case that involves kind of Im implied lexicography Cography that's almost explicit, right? As used herein, almost sounds like a, a definite, you know, explicit definition. So this would be a good case for you to have in your pocket uh, for those sorts of situations. CISVAL is not construing the meaning of a term. It's a means plus function claim construction case. So, and it deals with when the corresponding structure is, an, is a chip programmed to perform an algorithm, right? The, WMS gaming uh, situation for corresponding structure. And sometimes there's no algorithm at all. And sometimes there's a little bit of an algorithm, but it's a pretty lame algorithm. And the question is, when does an expert get to come in and say a bunch of stuff? And when there's no algorithm at all, the expert doesn't get to say anything. The, the court can on its own just say there's no algorithm. You got to have a corresponding algorithm. And if there's no corresponding algorithm, the claims are invalid. But if there is some algorithm, then the board, in this case, was required to allow in the expert testimony on whether that algorithm was enough. Now, there's not a bright line between no algorithm and some. We had a case where there really was no algorithm, but our opponent said, well, there's a three-step algorithm. Receive the data, process the data, and send a result. Well, that's not an algorithm for processing the data, right? It's just saying process the data, and it's and that's not an algorithm anyway. It's just something any computer would do. Um, so we ended up winning that, but it shows you that, you know, with with enough budget and creativity, you can shift one of these cases um, from from one category to the next. And then Google, um, that was a case that talked about multiple inputs uh, to a uh, to a particular uh, thermostat situation. And there was some question about whether they had to be separate or not, or whether they could be combined. And this refines the Becton Dickinson and Engels industry cases, which I should have italicized, but I missed that. Um, they don't create a per se rule, should have italicized the Latin also, that separately listed claim elements are distinct components regardless of the intrinsic record. So we run into that sometimes, right? Where you say, well, how much, how different do things need to be um, from each other? Here it came up in a claim construction situation. Sometimes it comes up in infringement situations. Um, I'm trying to remember there was a high chair case. Uh, I forget the name of it, but it was, you know, whether the different parts of a high chair could be both parts for the high chair and parts of the frame or whether whether they couldn't. But that that's an issue that comes up a lot. So I think this is a good case to have in your quiver. Next slide, please. We're on the downhill, we're almost there. And we're gonna hit the post. Um, prosecution, draft your claims with a focus on the terms that matter. You know, know what matters, what doesn't. As I said, modifiers matter, pay attention to those. Know what terms cause problems, right? I say like how tight a relationship should be. If you say something is on something else, does that mean it has to be in direct connection? If you say something's connected, does that require a direct connection or an indirect connection? Um, if you say something results in something else, does it have to result in it alone or can it be helped by other things, right? So connection words often create all sorts of claim construction problems. So be very careful when you're reciting connection words in your claims. So pay attention to that sort of thing as you read cases and then as you're uh, drafting your patents, uh, make sure that you put extra focus on connection words, adjectives and adverbs, that sort of thing. Um, litigation, don't assume that de novo means de novo. You know, the judges respect other judges. There's going to be some deference to the district court. The reason I say that is we often see when we do appeals, uh, the people that handled it below will be all excited and say, well, we don't care because it's de novo review of this claim construction, so we're gonna raise this issue. And you have to tell them, you know, yeah, but the issue's weak, <laughs> right? It's not a good claim construction position that you have. Uh, so de novo really isn't helping you. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe we should look at something that might have a more deferential review on appeal, but 
is something where you know the other side's expert really screwed up and we can make a better argument right um it's not always true you know you got to balance all these things but don't assume that de novo is always is truly de novo um pick a construction that pastes into the claim logically it doesn't have to look great if you put your construction in but if the if the claim like more than doubles in size when you paste your construction in place of the word, that's probably not a good result. It doesn't look natural. And then don't read limitations into the claim language. Sometimes you'll see even constructions where like the word is widget, and then the construction is something along the lines of, well, a widget with a flat top. And it's like, wait, you can't put the word back in its own construction because it's plain as day that you're now adding words to that word word for you know you're adding limitations to the claim and you're not supposed to do that um, so those those are a few helpful tips we are at the post we are basically done but we will take more questions I don't see any maybe um, Natika is younger and more technically advanced than I am on the on the chat side so she might know also but I'll I'll uh, read our outro and then we'll stick around for questions if any pop up so here's the outro uh, that's all the time we have today. Thank you for attending our webinar. We'll post an on-demand replay soon at fr.com. If you have any questions regarding CLE credit, email Fish's MCLE team at MCLE team at fr.com. Visit fr.com for more information. And as a reminder, the next uh, CLE is February 22nd, Hatchback Waxman 101. It ought to be a good time for everyone. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, coming today, and have a great Valentine's Day.